Guys, all the cars that you see in these videos are for sale on my website, www.woodsandbarclay.com. Enjoy the video. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today is part three in the series on the 1985 Cali Wagon. Now today I'm going to do a valve adjustment. We're going to put in a new radiator. I'm going to do the hood pad and I'm also going to repair the original Hirschman antenna. I almost forgot I'm also going to do the rear passenger door check strap. So let's go ahead and get started. So before I get started, I'll show you guys the, uh, the Hirschman antenna. I've got it out of the car. It's over here on the bench. And we have a new antenna mast that we're going to install in it. Uh, also, over here, uh, I've started getting in all the parts that I want to replace on the vehicle. There'll be several more videos showing all of this. This won't all be done in this video. But for example, we have the rear SLS components over here. Uh, this, uh, there's the accumulators, genuine Mercedes. There's two of them. I just I took one out of every box so you could see them. Uh, here we have the, well, that's the air filter. There's the SLS uh, fluid filter. That is the SLS leveling rod, genuine Mercedes. That is a brand new SLS leveling valve. Uh, we have our genuine Mercedes engine mounts ordered from the Classic Center. Let's see, moving up here, we're getting into the front suspension. Uh, we have our ball joints. Again, I just have one taken out of every box so you can see what they look like. Uh, we have new tie rod ends, uh, inner and outer. Uh, there is, oh, this is going to be interesting. I'm going to install some W126 300 SD lower control arm bushings because those are heavier duty than the uh, 123 and uh, they're just better bushings and they fit on the 123 chassis fine. Uh, there's our drag link, our steering shock. We have both upper control arms. We have two uh, sway bar end links. There is the guide rod mount. We have two of those. We move over here, we have two new front HD Bilstein shocks. Uh, here is a brand new set of genuine Mercedes axles. I had these rebuilt by uh, CV Source. Let's see, what is that, April 1st of this year. Uh, moving up here, now the rear, the rear calipers are brand new on the car, so I ordered two uh, front calipers, Ate. That's the original equipment that would have come on the car. There's some hoses, brake hoses for the front. We have two new front rotors. Uh, I forgot to mention, here's the wheel bearings. Wheel bearings and seals. Uh, let's see, brake pads. And here's the new radiator. And uh, we're going to be doing this in the video today, and there'll be several videos showing all of this stuff. There are no cheap aftermarket parts here. These are all extremely high quality, very good parts. Now, all these components are original OEM manufacturers. You'll see a lot of the suspension stuff is uh, by Limforder, and Limforder actually made the suspension that Mercedes branded and sold as Mercedes. Uh, some of the parts are genuine Mercedes because you can't order those from other places like the leveling valve or the accumulators. And now for the radiator, uh, the OEM was Bayer, uh, B-E-H-R. However, Bayer is now made in India, so I am no longer using Bayer. I'm using Nissan's because this is, uh, I think this is made in Denmark. It's Norway or Denmark. And guys, I've been doing this long enough to know that parts that are manufactured in Europe are superior to parts that are manufactured in India. So I'm now using Nissan's because it is manufactured in Europe. So let's go ahead and uh, get to work on the car over here. Okay, here we are at the right rear door. And you'll notice it only opens that far. Now, that either means someone put in the wrong door strap back here, or this door check strap is uh, damaged. So we're gonna take off the door panel and get in there and look and see what's going on. Okay, so to take off the door panel, See, I can't open it all the way, so it's going to be a little tight in here. First, we take off uh, the trim pieces. Behind the actual handle, there's a screw. So, you take a screwdriver, you can get behind here, 
and pry off the little plastic insert that covers the uh, covers that screw. And I can tell this one has never been out of here. So I'm guessing the, uh, the door check strap in here is damaged. But behind here, once I get this handle off, there's a little Phillips head screw. And there we go. We got that out. Two screws under the armrest here. And we're just going to take off this little plastic piece that I pried out a minute ago. And now that allows us to pull this trim piece off right here. And we can get access to one screw right there. It's a Phillips. There we go. We can slide off the door handle. And that's it. Now we just need to get a little pry tool and we're gonna pry out the clips. All right, we can take this pry tool and we can come around the bottom and there's a clip there. There's one there, there, there. All right, our door panel is now loose. So we have to unplug our window switch behind here. There we go. Yeah, I can see this door has never been uh, taken apart. So we'll go ahead and get the door strap out and we'll lubricate the window actuator. Okay, so I have delicately removed the plastic uh, membrane. Those plastic membranes are a uh, water and vapor, water vapor or water moisture barrier. That's what I was trying to say, a moisture barrier. Uh, so we definitely want to put that back on. Uh, this, th this door has never been opened up before. So what's cool is you guys can still see uh, the Cosmoline wax Mercedes would spray down in here. And I've temporarily got a window switch installed so I can activate uh, actuate the window. Okay, so let's show you um, the window check strap. And to get access to that, there we go. So there's a little clip right here. See that clip? We can pull that off. Oh, I'm sorry. This little clip is right there. See that? We can pull that clip off, and then we have a pin. We can tap that pin out, and you want to make sure you save the little white, um, that's like a nylon bushing that goes on top. So let me go ahead and knock this pin out right here. Okay, it was not really possible for me to record that, but you can see I've, I've knocked the pin up right here. But the way you do that, you just get a little punch, put it on the bottom of it, and then get a hammer. I have two different, two different weight hammers here. First I tried it with the small one, then I had to go to a little bit bigger, heavier hammer. And we tapped that. We tapped that pin loose, and now I need to put the chisel right here on the bottom lip, like right here, not the chisel, but the punch, and just tap it slightly, or tap it delicately, and it'll come out the top, and I'll show you when I'm done. Okay, so I just tapped a little pin out there. Now we're gonna lubricate it when we put it back in there. Just set it down here in the floorboard. All right, now this little arm, you can pull this arm out now, and see that little bushing? You want to make sure you don't lose that because we want to put that little nylon bushing back in there. There we go. That's a little nylon spacer bushing that goes between the top here and the top mounting bracket. So we'll put that back down there too. And now we can open the door all the way up because our check strap is no longer connected. Now to get the check strap out, there's a 10 millimeter here and here. So we'll undo those. And then we have one in the back right here. We'll undo that one. And that check strap will remove from inside the car and then we'll examine it. And now our check strap can come out. There we go, let me set that down there. And they just pull straight through. And we'll take a look at it. There we go. I'll show you guys the problem right here. So these check straps, they have, let's see, there's an indent there and up there, two little notches. That's when you open the door to like click to one position and then click fully open. And you can see the ball bearing 
has popped out of this side and that's why it's jammed. There you go, it just fell out. There you go, that little ball bearing fell out. So let's go get a good check strap and uh, install it back in the car. Okay, I keep a stash of check straps right up here and I have two of them, uh, but I found one. This was actually out of a blue Mercedes. Uh, so it matches the blue check strap. And you can see I've already lubricated this one really well. See, I've got grease all down in there. And you can see the ball bearing. You can see it right down in there. Both are correctly intact on this one. Uh, this one is excellent condition. So let's go ahead and put this original part back in the car. And guys, the installation is exactly... <laughs> It's exactly the same. We just want to flip it over like this. Stick it back in here. There we go. And put our bolts back in here. Okay, we have the uh, little nylon nut back on here. Now, I don't have the pin pressed all the way through because I want to test it first so I don't have to knock that pin back out. I have it about halfway. So the door is all the way open now. And you can see... It stops at the center section or the center indent and there we go so when I pull it open it correctly stops halfway and then opens all the way so we have a good excellent working check strap now so the next thing I want to do I want to go while we're in here we want to go ahead and lower down our window and lubricate the window track um, and we're going to need to do that on all the doors. That's a common maintenance item on a 123 chassis or 126 chassis or any Mercedes. Okay, I have power applied. And we're going to go ahead, lower our window here, and we can see that the there's our actuator right here. And we want to take, uh, I like to use Molly Graphite, and we want to lubricate, get real good down in here. Lubricate the tracks here and you guys can't see but I want to get up in here too and lubricate the tracks in there And I'll go around the rest of the check straps are good That's really just a freak thing that happened on this one and we have our window motor lubricated Our actuator nice and lubricated and we'll go around and lubricate the rest of the doors and then we're going to move on to installing the radiator Okay, let me show you the door panel reassembly. Now, we want to put back in our uh, plastic cover here. And let's make sure. Yeah, it's going to go on like that. Now, before we put this on, I want to use um, Super 77 multi-purpose multi adhesive. This is pretty much the same stuff that uh, the factory would use. Now, we just want to... Spray it on the factory spots, right down here. It had a little right up in here, and then right around the top, right here. All right, now we can put our plastic back on. Now it's important to line up the holes. Now we're gonna use these as a guide. That's where the door handle is. We'll come around here. Okay, right there's a good starting spot. And you wanna line up where the little clips go in. Use those as our alignment points. All right, here we go. We'll take this over here and we have another clip that's gonna go in here. So, or another retaining pin. We're gonna line that hole up there. There we go. There we go back in the factory location exactly how it's supposed to be all right now we can go ahead and get our door panel back on here raise up our window now on the back of the door panel see the little white clips you want to make sure all those are intact they go around the door uh, make sure they're all intact you can replace some if needed they're all intact on this car Hopefully I'm not standing right in the way of the camera. We're going to undo our temporary window switch. Then I want to get in here. First I'm going to plug back in the window switch. Okay, so there's a rail along the back here. And that rail 
has to uh, clip on up here. So, okay. And our rail is in place. There we go. Perfect. And now we can push all our clips back in. Perfect. Nice, that is installed perfectly. All right, now let's just go ahead and reattach our handle and the rest of the hardware and I'll show you when we're done. There we go guys, everything is back together and we have a great working window strap now and we've lubricated the window, reassembled everything. Test that, yeah, it works beautifully. Mission accomplished. Okay guys, now we're gonna remove this radiator and this radiator is working fine. Um, however, I'm, I just wanna make this the ultimate Cali wagon. So I'm just, I'm, I'm replacing everything from like the radiator all the way to the back of the car. Um, but to get these radiators out, it is super easy. And uh, first we wanna pop off our clips up here, undo our overflow line, disconnect our upper radiator hose, and disconnect the upper oil cooler mount and the lower oil cooler mount, and then the hoses at the bottom, and uh, this guy will slide right out. All right, watch how easy this is, guys. So first we're gonna do our upper radiator hose. We're gonna go ahead and get that loose, and we'll pinch that so it slips off. There we go. Now we want to do the oil cooler mount. That's a, a 10 millimeter, and we just go right there. We pull that screw out and remove the mount. There we go. That's now loose up here. Next thing we're going to do, uh, get a little screwdriver and remove your fan shroud clips. And keep in mind, all this stuff is going off to be re-zinc plated anyway. Um, but we'll, we'll just get it all removed and reinstalled to show you guys how to do it because I've already got a set I've actually sent off to zinc plating for this car. There we go, we'll get these clips out here. Now, let me show you something you wanna save when you're removing your radiator. It's these little rubber pieces. I'll show you those, because we need to transfer those to the new radiator. There we go, this one came off. So. It's these little rubber pieces. You wanna make sure you save these to put on to your new radiator. That's just the rubber isolators that the clip goes over. So we'll save that. Now, before we lift the car up, we wanna get the uh, reservoir overflow tube. We'll disconnect that. There we go. And we'll just pinch that and pull it off here. All right, we'll just set that aside. And there we go. That radiator is disconnected and we'll move our fan shroud out of the way. Now let's get the car up in the air and disconnect the fittings on the bottom. Okay, you see it's dirty down here, but what we wanna do is uh, remove the reservoir uh, tube, the lower radiator hose, and disconnect our transmission uh, oil cooler lines. And we're actually gonna go ahead and replace these lines also while we're at it. And then the radio will, uh, the radio, <laughs> the radiator will be, uh, oh, there's one more piece right here. That's the uh, lower oil cooler bracket. We want to take that out. Okay, pretty easy. We just get our, uh... and you can also use a socket um, to do it, which I'm going to use on this one. There we go. And we can go ahead and pull them off. There we go. And keep in mind, I've already drained the radiator, so that's why no coolant's coming out. Might get a little residual coolant here, we'll see. There we go. All right, now let's go ahead and detach our oil cooler line for the transmission. It's just a 19 millimeter we'll stick on here. And there we go. Disconnect that. Now a little transmission fluid's gonna come out. Won't hurt anything. Get this one out. And then we'll do our lower oil cooler bracket, which is right there. And all this stuff is getting replaced with freshly zinc plated parts, so. All 
right. Now the radiator is disconnected from the oil cooler. All right, look at all those bugs. That's why I like to change these things. Like I said, it was still working, but time to put in a new one. There we go. Look at all that, those bugs and dirt build up and all that. I'm sure that affected cooling a little bit. I mean, the car was cooling fine, but it is gonna cool much better with this one. So let's go ahead and get this back in the car. All right, before we put our radio in there, radiator back in, I'm gonna blow out some uh, leaves and dirt and stuff from down here. All right, let's go ahead and pop in a brand new radiator. All right, I've got our hoses reattached and I've cleaned up under here a little bit. You can see our brand new radiator right there. Uh, temporarily reattached the transmission hoses because I'm changing those. And I got our bracket or mount uh, reattached here. So let's go ahead and uh, lower down the car and fill it back up with coolant. Okay guys, for the coolant, you wanna use uh, Zurex G05. Uh, it's the gold stuff. Uh, I think Mercedes has some new stuff out now. It's the blue stuff, but uh, either one of those are fine. And we want to go ahead and fill it up. And then we want to run the car, get it up to operating temperature. And uh, bleed any air bubbles out of the system. And uh, this is nice. This is a new, uh, this is a new coolant reservoir. I guess the previous owner had a leak in their coolant reservoir. So we got a brand new one here. Now, actually, I shouldn't have tightened this back down because, guys, what I like to do is I like to fill uh, the upper radiator hose. I like to get some coolant down there so it flows into our thermostat area, and that really helps with bleeding the air out of the system. Let's get that a little looser. There we go. All right, we're going to pull that off of there, and then we're going to pour coolant directly into here. There we go. All right, we'll tighten that back down. And now we need to get the car up to operating temperature and get the air to bleed out. Okay, so now I'm gonna crank the car. I'm gonna keep the reservoir cap off and we're gonna put the uh, get the car up to temperature and then we're gonna run the defrosters. That way it circulates uh, through the heater core and that'll purge any bubbles out of the system. Okay, we're just going to let it run for a while. I'll purge the air out. And then uh, when we're done, we'll let everything cool off overnight. And we will do a valve adjustment tomorrow. Hey guys, it's the next day. And I'm going to go ahead and start on a valve adjustment. Now, I think it was last week, I already shot some video of me doing the hood pad. So that's going to be a little out of sync in the timeline of the video. You'll see that next. But you can see it's actually already removed from the car right now. But... We'll, we'll flash back to when I was uh, removing the hood pad. Anyway, let's go ahead and uh, dive into the valve adjustment. Okay, before we can start the valve adjustment, we have to pop off a bunch of components up here. Cruise control actuator. <clears throat> let's see. Then we're gonna undo the Bowden cable. Now, we need a screwdriver to pop that loose. There we go, that's just gonna pop off right there. Now the Bowden cable has a little plastic clip here and you just pinch it and it slides through there. We can just take that through there like that. We'll set that to the side. Actually, we're gonna pop this loose right here. There we go. And then we're just gonna take this off and slide it out of the way. Now keep in mind all these parts are getting re-zinc plated, guys. Um, so they're all eventually coming off and getting shipped out to be plated anyway. All right, let's move this. This is the uh, AC shutoff switch. When you're under max acceleration, it'll click that little switch and shut off your AC. 
Now we need to remove the linkage right here. There it goes. All right, next thing we're gonna do is get our clip back here. Let's pull that out. There we go. And we'll pop off this one here. There we go. Now let's see, we should be able to slide these two back. There we go. Oh, I forgot to pop it off the injection pump. And we'll just remove this guy. Okay, now you see everything's disconnected. We can lift off the valve cover. <clears throat> now, guys, something that I do that a lot of people don't do, I remove the cruise control module. It's only, uh, our actuator, it's only three 10 millimeter bolts here. And you can set this out of the way, but it makes it much easier to remove the valve covers when this is just sitting over out of the way. So let's go ahead and take that off. All right, and then we can just move that just a little out of the way right there, just like that. That's all you gotta do, just slightly to the side, and then it lets this lip easier, uh, it makes it clear easier to remove the valve cover. All right, there's our valve cover gasket. All right, let's take a look down in here. Looks very nice. No scoring on the cam lobes. That means regular oil changes were done. Looks very clean under here. And uh, let's go ahead and get a socket on the front of the crank. And let's see, we're probably gonna do, looks like this one first. That's almost up at the 12 o'clock to one o'clock position. See that cam lobe? That's got to come up to the one o'clock position. And then we want to get a feeler gauge underneath it right there on the rocker arm. And it has to be a certain uh, gap right there in order for the valve adjustment to be correct. And I'll show you guys that. Okay, we've got that on the crank and then I can rotate the crank clockwise. There we go. We just turned it a little bit. And now let's go back up top and see where the rocker, I mean the cam lobe is. All right, there we go. See how that got that cam lobe pointing straight? Uh, it's almost, it. it's like not quite 12 o'clock. We need to go a little bit further. So let me go do that and I'll come back in a second. Okay, there we go. We have that cam slightly past 12 o'clock in between 12 and one o'clock, that's where you want it. That way the base of the cam lobe, which looks like this right here, here's the tip, here's the base. So there's the tip and the base is on the rocker. Now we wanna get a feeler gauge under there and see what the clearance is. Now, right up here on your core support, it says valve lash at water temp below 30 degrees. That means a cold engine. Your intake is 0.10 millimeters, exhaust 0.35 millimeters. Okay, I have my two feeler gauges. Here's my 0.10, here's my 0.35. And we're doing valve number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And number nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, is an exhaust. And I ordered this from Uncle Kent out there at Mercedes Source years ago. Great little diagram that shows you your intakes and exhaust. Now, the exhaust is a 0.35. The intake is a 0.10. Your exhaust is a little bit bigger gap because the exhaust valve gets um, hotter because it's exhaust gases and there will be more expansion there. Your intake is cooler because it's cold air coming in. So you don't need as big of a gap. Just take this feeler gauge and get the Bowden cable out of the way. There we go. And we're going to see if it goes in there. All right. See, it's a little tight. So this needs a valve adjustment. See, I can't get the feeler gauge in that gap. So let's loosen that up a little bit and get it set correctly. And then we're gonna go through every one of these. Okay, I really can't get a good view here, but let me show you what we're doing. So we're actually adjusting this one here. But if you look over here next to it, you'll see you have a silver uh, nut and then underneath it, you have a black nut. So uh, basically those are locked together. 
So you want to unlock them and your silver nut is your adjustment. You can move it up the valve stem or down the valve stem. So if we go down the valve stem, it's gonna move it down and it's gonna increase our gap. If we go up, it's gonna move it up closer uh, to the lifter, I'm sorry, to the uh, rocker arm and it's gonna close the gap. So let me get the adjustment wrenches and we'll go ahead and do that. Okay, here's the valve adjustment wrenches and these wrenches allow me to get one on the bottom nut. Let's see which one's gonna go on there. Buy this one right here. Okay, that's on the bottom nut, and this one's gonna go on the top nut. Okay, here we go. Now we just wanna break these loose, and that'd be counterclockwise. You wanna turn the top one counterclockwise to do that. Now we're gonna spin the bottom nut down the valve stem and then follow it with the top nut, and that will open up our gap. All right, spin the top one down. All right, we opened it up a little bit. Let me see what that adjustment looks like. So, you put this wrench here, that should slip right in there with a little bit of friction. See, it's got a little friction, little bit of drag, and that's a perfect adjustment. That's 0.35 millimeters. Now we need to lock those back into place. So to lock it back into place, you wanna hold the top nut still. That was what was changing the gap. And you wanna bring the bottom nut up to meet it. So we're, tight, uh, we're loosening the bottom nut or moving it up the valve stem until it makes contact with the top. Okay, there we go. There's the one we were testing. And you want a little bit of drag. See how I got a little bit of drag when that goes in there? That's perfectly adjusted. All right, so we have done number nine and number seven. I'm gonna mark those off on my little diagram here. Now, without recording, I have to go through the rest of them and I'll be back in a minute. Okay, I just finished the valve adjustment. It took me about 45 minutes. See, I got a check by all of them. Now, the only one that was still in spec is uh, number 10 back there in the back. The rest of them were a little tight, so I had to loosen them up uh, just a little bit. So it was time for a valve adjustment. This thing should run amazing now. So let's go ahead and uh, get the valve cover and valve cover gasket back on. In the meantime, I have also uh, cleaned up and refinished the air filter housing assembly. You can see how beautiful it looks. I got it back to its original semi-gloss paint. And uh, what I wanna do now, I just wanna clean this up a little in the parts washer. Now keep in mind, all these parts are gonna come off and be sent out to be um, zinc plated, zinc dichromate plated like they did from the factory. But I just wanna get it all back on the car, take it out for a quick test drive and see where I'm at before I start the rest of the restoration process. All right, let's just go up. I had to clean up the valve cover. The parts washer just dissolves any grease and oil. See how easy all that stuff comes off? Let's go ahead and get this thing nice and cleaned up. Okay, now I need to make sure that that gasket didn't roll over anywhere. So I'm gonna go around with a flashlight, make sure it all went on there good. And we just need to reinstall all our 13 millimeter nuts. And guys, you don't need to crank these down. It's only like 10 foot pounds or so. All right, let's get our linkage reinstalled. And like I said, all of that linkage, everything is coming back off in a later video because it's all getting replaced with freshly zinc plated parts. Okay, I've got all the linkage uh, reinstalled and I did lubricate it a little bit. Um, what I've also noticed on this car, there's a, that's a brand new master cylinder, brake master cylinder. And then when I was over here, I noticed it also has a brand new alternator. 
So that's pretty cool. Um, but what I forgot to do when I was installing the radiator, duh, is uh, put in a new thermostat. I don't know how old that thermostat is. Uh, so I want to go ahead and put in a new thermostat. And then we're going to get the car up on the lift and do an oil change. And then I'll take it out, test drive it, and see where we're at. Okay, I've got the air filter assembly back in place. Let's go ahead and stick in our beautiful new air filter and get our lid on here. There we go. Very nice. There we go. All right, beautiful. Doesn't that look nice, you guys? All right, I'm gonna have to run up to the store and get some more coolant because I'm an about I'm about to uh, break the coolant loose uh, or the the thermostat housing open and the coolant's gonna come out. So there's just three 10 millimeter uh, bolts. Now, if your car is like if you're like a, have a northeast car or a car that has heavy corrosion, you need to be very careful cracking these loose because if they snap off in there, you're going to have a whole lot of fun trying to get those out. Um, now, this is a California car, uh, well, Washington State, but uh, manufactured and delivered in, you know, California. So this never saw any kind of road salt or anything. So these are coming right out. There's no corrosion whatsoever on this vehicle. Now there's one more down here on the bottom. It's actually a blind one. You gotta kinda get down there and just feel for it. There it is right there. And you can crack that one loose. And we'll get these three out and put ourselves a fresh thermostat in here. All right guys, while my coolant is draining, I wanna go ahead and prep these uh, bolts to put back in. You always wanna put a little anti-seize on them before you put them back in the thermostat housing because this is steel going into an aluminum housing and that'll prevent any corrosion. And you know, in the next 10 years or whatever, when the next guy does it, it'll be very easy to get out. Let me show you how you get, how you install this thermostat. So I'm gonna pull back the housing and I'm gonna pop out our thermostat. And it's very important you put it back in this way. All right, see how it came out guys? It goes in the engine. Here's the spring side. That goes into the engine. This side faces towards the front of the car because um, you can mess up and put it in backwards and you don't want to do that. All right, now there's a gasket that you get with the thermostat. Here's our new thermostat. And that gasket clips around the edges of the thermostat. Let's see if I can get it on here. There we go. It goes on like that. And this little hole right here, I think that's your uh, bypass. There you go. Right there. You see that little that little notch, that bypass area? That's how you want to install it. Okay, I've got all the bolts almost threaded in. And guys, it's very important. You do not crank these down. You just want to make them firm because these are very small bolts, steel bolts going into an aluminum housing. And if you try to crank these down, you're going to strip the threads right out, and then you're going to be replacing your thermostat housing. So you just snug them all up. All right, there we go. New thermostat is in. Let's get the coolant back in here. All right, we have our new thermostat in and topped it off with coolant. And we've been running the car for about 10 minutes with the new thermostat and radiator. And look at that right on the mark that thermostat opened up or like maybe 80 81 degrees also just wanted to point out how smooth that engine is running look at that it's not even vibrating in the engine compartment Incredibly healthy 617. All right, while the engine's hot, let's go ahead and get this oil out of here, do a fresh oil change, get a new oil filter in there. Okay, I like using uh, Hanks filters, and uh, every filter 
comes with a new, there it is, a new crush washer. So let's go ahead, put our new crush washer on the drain plug and get that back on the car. Then we'll lower it and put in a filter and fill it up. Okay, we got our drain plug back in and I took like about 10 minutes just to clean up the oil pan uh, real nice because it was dirty, but you can see how nice it looks now. I also wiped off some of these lines. You can see the zinc plating is still under here, but now my, uh, my oil pan is clean and I like clean oil pans. All right, let's go ahead and get this oil filter out of here. It's just two 13 millimeter nuts back here. Now all your vacuum lines are in the way right here when you're trying to take your oil filter cap off. Sometimes you'll knock one loose. So when you, uh, when you put it back in, just make sure all your vacuum lines are still connected well. There we go. Get this guy out of here. And we can grab the handle on our oil filter. And we'll pull that right out of there. When you're changing the oil, the uh, oil filters come with a new uh, O-ring. There you go, that's your ceiling ring. So we wanna throw that one away. And they always come with a new one in the box. So let me lubricate this a little bit and we'll slip it on there. All right, got that nice and lubricated. We'll slide it on there. And let's go ahead and insert our new filter. Go right down there. Okay, and this is where you need to make sure you don't knock any of your vacuum lines loose. Because you have to move them out of the way a little bit to get our cap back on here. All right, there we go. And I'm just checking to make sure they're all still plugged in, and they are. And let's go ahead and put our cap, uh, our, our 13 millimeter back on here. Now, guys, you don't want to crank these down. Your gasket does all the sealing. Um, you just want to put, you know, 10 foot pounds or so. They're not very tight. Uh, these are studs, and if you over tighten them, you will pull your studs out. Okay, guys, I used to use Rotella T4 uh, for years, and I've recently switched uh, to Lubrication Engineers. This is their Monolec engine oil. It's for diesel engines, 15W40. This stuff is very good. We used the transmission oil in the uh, race car when I was professionally racing. And uh, just an outstanding, kind of a boutique company that makes outstanding oil. And if you uh, contact Clay Calk over there, they'll give you like a 10% discount if you mention Woods and Barclay. Guys, I don't make any money off that whatsoever. I just, uh, I like this product and I don't mind promoting this product for these guys. All right. It's going to take about this full jug. We'll go ahead and let it settle, and then we'll uh, um, crank it up, let it circulate, let it settle again, and then we'll check our levels. Okay, while I was waiting on the oil to settle, I uh, got the pressure washer out and cleaned and disinfected the inside of the uh, washer reservoir. And guys, this one is in amazing condition. Normally, these things are just in awful condition, and they're cracked, and they're leaking, I mean, I almost got it back to its original uh, white color. You can see it's, it's faded a little yellow up here, but that's just how they age. But uh, I got that cleaned up really nice, and we'll put uh, some fresh windshield washer fluid in there and uh, put it back in the car. Okay, another little random thing that I did off camera is replace, see these two green uh, vacuum pods? I think they're like uh, restrictor pods where they restrict the vacuum flow, uh, but they're in the transmission circuit. This one goes to the uh, VCV valve right here, and this one goes to the uh, flying saucer. That's just what we call it, guys, the blue flying saucer. Um, but there's two of them in line. Now, I took out uh, the original 40-year-old ones that were in there, and I ordered these from Mercedes. These are genuine Mercedes. It looks like they've upgraded them a little bit or modified them but I replace these because these can give you an even better transmission transmission shifting feel. They enhance it even more because um, sometimes these are a little worn out or not working correctly. So we've got those installed. Okay, we're done with a very basic service. We haven't gotten into the stuff like brake fluid, power steering fluid, transmission fluid. 
uh, SLS fluid. We still need to do all that, but I'm just getting it to a baseline with some fresh oil filter valve adjustment so I can go out for a test drive, see how the car is, and then I'm gonna get further into the restoration. So next, what we wanna start on is the antenna. So I have the Hirschman antenna out of the car here, and I've already loosened the screws here. We'll show you guys inside of it. And all it is is a uh, broken mast. That's all we're dealing with. The mast was just kind of seized in place. So I got a new mast. It's, uh, it's right there. I just took it out of the box. And you can see it looks great in here. We will uh, clean it up just a little bit. We'll re-lubricate the worm gear here. And you can see there's still some grease down in there that the factory applied but really it looks beautiful in here all we need to do take this mast out and get the broken uh, plastic piece see this the plastic piece in here over over time it will break off down in here and just won't work anymore actually this one you can see it right there it still may be intact but uh, the mast is like seized in place so let's get started on this hey guys it's the next day and uh, before i dive into the antenna repair I just took this car out for a test drive. Now that I've got the DPF or the diesel particulate filter removed and I've done a valve adjustment and this car drives awesome. Right about 3,500 RPMs, that turbo kicks in and it's one of the fastest wagons I've ever driven. Um, I mean, I, I, I went out there and I got on it, like flooring it zero to 60, like several times. And this thing is awesome. Um, so at this point, I'm really considering keeping this wagon for myself because it's the only California model wagon <clears throat> that I've had. And I just like the way these, the turbos and the transmissions, I really like these California models. It was a one year only in 1985. Like I said, it's the first one I've had. So I'm going to go ahead and continue with the video series and just pull out all the stops on this car. But um, I don't know. I'm thinking about keeping this one. Maybe I'll drive it around for a little while and then sell it. I, I don't know. But uh, anyway, let's get back to the Hirschman antenna repair. All right, I have the antenna on the bench here. Now I have my 12 volt. This is like a battery jump box. It just provides 12 volt power. So I have ground to pin uh, three and constant power to pin six. Let me turn on the jump box. And I want to see if we can just get the antenna to move. Now... You have to jump her from pin six over to pin two, and it should make the antenna come out. Let's see. Okay. The motor works. What's going on? Uh, this antenna mast is jammed where it's not moving. It's like frozen in place, so it's just spinning instead of moving the uh, actually moving the cable out. So we need to disassemble. We need to disassemble this mast. Let me turn off my power. And uh, we need to get it out of here. So I'm going to take out that screw there. We should be able to unscrew this. We, we'll see. Yeah, see? Oh, there we go. Good. There we go. There's our jammed mast. Okay. There we go. Okay, cool. There is the, the nylon here. Let's see if you can see this. There we go. That's that nylon cable that goes through in there. So I'm going to try to get this pulled out. I'm going to see if I can run the antenna out now since we have this detached. And it should feed the cable out of here. Okay, come on. Got it. There we go. Yeah, this thing, this this thing is just it was jammed in there. There you go. See all that corrosion? Yeah. There we go. It wasn't the antenna wasn't strong enough to bust through that corrosion. All right, good. We got that out of here. Now I'm gonna blow this out with some compressed air and spray a little deox in here just to clean it up and re-grease my worm gear. There's the uh, the worm gear there, and then we're going to feed in our new antenna. All right, we're just going to spray a 
Spread that out a little. And this is electronics cleaner, deoxid. And this won't hurt anything. We're just going to spray that around in here real good. And then we're going to dry it out with some compressed air. Right, right down here. There's our worm gear. Now you don't want to get the grease on the uh, little splines that grip on the antenna mast. So we want to make sure we just get it down there in the worm gear. There we go. All right, nice. There's some good lubrication in there now. All right, let's try to get our new mast installed. Now guys, this is a smooth uh, line. See this line right here? It doesn't have teeth on it. This is actually a smooth line. Some of the antennas have teeth on them and they feed in with teeth. Now, for the antennas that require a smooth line, you can actually get away with using the lines that have teeth on them. But for the lines that require, for the antennas that require the teeth, you cannot use, uh, you cannot use the, the smooth line, the smooth cable. I'd have to get the little top off right here. I haven't removed that. I had to clip off the antenna to get it out. Okay, that's probably the original mast. Not probably. I, it is the original mast that was in there. So, all right, there we go. Get that old broken piece out of there. Okay, now we can feed in our new line. There we go. All right, I had to get power to it and then get this to feed down in there. So, okay, yep, yeah, that's what's going to happen. As soon as I apply power, it's going to try to go in there. There it goes. All right, let's try that one more time. Now I can flick a little lever here. Almost. All right, so we have the antenna working again, but I need it to park. And to get it to see it, we need it to extend, but I need it to fully park. And to do that, I need to get it in the car um, so the radio can send the signal to keep going so it'll fully park. So I guess the next thing we're gonna do is hook up the original uh, Becker 612 radio in the car. All right, guys. The good thing about this car, uh, I removed the aftermarket radio and all of the original wiring is still in this car. Let's see here. That's for, um, that's for the speakers. And there we go. Here is for the radio. Now I have, um, so I just need to strip these back and I have an original uh, Becker uh, radio connection. And this one here is for the antenna. So we got black, brown, and gray. And there we go. So I just need to strip those back and uh, solder those connections on here. And that's good. All the original wiring is here. And I'll also need to solder on um, the speaker connections. Okay. okay, I've got my soldering iron hooked up, and there was a small problem that I noticed when I was connecting up the radio, the main power connector. I noticed that it did not have the red wire for the main power. It just had brown, black, and gray. Let's see. Uh, gray is your uh, accessory power. Like when you turn on the headlights, it lights up the radio. Um, but red is your constant power so what i've done i've just opened up the pin uh, the connector mercedes makes these where you can rebuild them you just clip it open and i pulled out the little pin and i can see on this spare connector that i had where the red wire used to be attached so i just want to 
heat up my soldering iron and re-solder the red wire. And guys, there's other ways to do this. I've seen so many hacks at radio shops that how they hook up power and get all this stuff working. But I'm putting this back to exactly how this car would have left the factory. Everything's soldered. There's no little cheesy twist twist wraps or whatever you call those connectors that you just twist wires together. I'm doing this the right way. So let me tin the tip of my solder iron. Where, you know, if anybody took this car apart in 20 years, they would not notice that I re-soldered in the connector. It would look, and it, it would be factory original. All right, let's see how that's in there. Let's get this heated up. Yeah, there's the old wires right there. See how I just knocked them out of there by heating up the solder? There they go, right there. And I'm going to push back in my new wires. So, boom, there we go. All right, I've got that wire through. Now, I want to put some solder on the other side. And there we go. Perfect. That is now in there. Now I'm going to clip off that excess. And there we go. We have a red wire reattached. <clears throat> there we go. Perfect. Now I'll put that right back in there. And we snap our clip back together. There we go. Now we have <coughs> our missing red wire and all the factory original connectors there. So let's go, uh, we'll temporarily put this in the car before we solder it, hook it up to the radio and hook up the antenna, see if we have radio power and antenna power. And then next we'll move to the speaker connections. All right, so here you can see red, black, gray, brown, and here's the original connections. Uh, from the car because the previous people that installed the aftermarket radio just clipped off this connector so I'm going to temporarily now my battery's unplugged because I'm dealing with a hot wire here all right we'll just twist that together and throw a piece of tape over it so it doesn't touch anything because I just want to get it powered up and test everything here's our red there's our gray there's our black Keep in mind, this is not permanent. I'm going to solder these connections after I verify everything works. And there's our brown. Now, what I did, there we go. Now, what I did off camera, I went ahead and added a blade connector. That's our antenna. So, in the antenna, let's see if you can see this. The antenna connects right there, and then there's our power connection. And you have to connect the antenna first, or else your power connection won't go in. All right, there we go. All right, that is enough to test our antenna. All right, I've got the antenna hooked up. Let's go ahead. We'll give it accessory power. All right, now if I turn on the... Oh, there we go. We have the uh, radio. Now I need to set the clock. Now if I turn on the headlights, there we go. Headlight power works. And our radio power works. Okay, so we know the radio works. Let's do, uh, we're going to put the antenna switch in the middle. And let's turn on the power. All right, perfect. Our antenna came up to half mast. Okay, yeah. now let's do full antenna. Go up to full mast. Nice. We have a beautiful working original Hirschman antenna. Check that out, guys. That's the original antenna, fully serviced, new antenna mast. All right, let's go ahead and make sure it goes down. All right, beautiful. Now I'm gonna try the, uh, I wanna try the manual controls here. So let's turn it back on. Okay, all right, it fully extends. Now I wanna put this at half mast. All right, now I'm gonna see, 
I'm gonna operate the switch here on the dash and go kind of up and down. And we'll see if we can control it. All right, I'm manually going down and I'm stopping. Going down a little more and stopping. Oh, there it went to half mast. See, if I go down and then let go, it correctly goes back to half mast. And then I put it all the way up. Now, if I switch it all the way down, like I don't want antenna, it correctly goes all the way down. All right, guys, so all that is functioning correctly. Now I need to actually solder these connections and put heat shrink around it to make it a professional connection. Uh, we got the antenna. And then next, I'm going to splice in. See, there's the original um, speaker wires. I'm going to just put on the correct connections, and those plug in right here on the white and black ports on the back of the radio. And then this will be restored back to 100% original wiring with an original 612 radio. Okay, now I have the temporary, uh, the speaker wires. The, there's the green ones there. I just have them temporarily taped in there. So let's put our antenna. It's up. And let's go ahead, turn on the radio, see if we get sound. They have the original yes. Okay. Both speakers are working. Let me fade to the back. Make sure our rear. Nice. Oh, beautiful. We got the antenna. Let's just make sure these speakers are playing correctly because I did fade it to the back. Here to help keep more money in your pocket. Start saving nice. now at workmoney.org. We have both rear speakers working. All right. This is awesome. Now I just have to solder it all back together. And I'll probably do that off camera and then show you the completed product. Oh, beautiful. There we go. Perfect. All right. Let's turn that off. That's always uh, very tedious to get the radio and radios and antennas working perfectly, but they are now. So now I have to solder all that together, put a little heat shrink uh, wrap over the wires, do a real professional job, and I'll show you that when I'm finished, and then we can install it back in the dash. Okay, I'm not going to film all of this, but I'll just show you um, how to properly do a professional solder on your radio wiring and uh, and then I'll do the rest and just show you what it looks like when it's done so the first thing you want to have are these this heat shrink tubing so we're gonna slide that over the wire because that's what we're gonna use a heat gun to melt over the completed solder joint <clears throat> now it's important how you wrap your wires most people cross the wires like that and then twist them together. That's not how you do it. What you do, because then you can't get your heat shrink tubing back over it. What you do is you hold them like parallel to each other almost, maybe at like a 30 degree angle. And you make, you make a twist like that. There you go. So instead of them twisting like that, they're twisted together like that. And so that way, once we apply the solder, we can slide the heat shrink back over it. It's not going to be this huge, messy, uh, messy connection. Okay, so first thing you want to do, you want to tin the tip of your soldering iron. Get a little solder on there. And then we'll wipe that off. And it should be a nice bright white silver. I mean, a, a nice bright silver. Next thing we want to do is actually heat the wire. You don't touch the solder to the soldering gun. You touch the solder to the heated wire. Here we go. Now the solder is melting into the wire. All right. That one is done. So I'll zoom in here. So see how nice and straight that is. And there's no big solder bubbles and the solder is now soaked into the wire that cannot come apart. Then you can pull your heat shrink tubing right over your solder joint. 
There we go, right like that. So it covers and protects that solder joint and that solder joint can't touch anything. Now we're gonna get a heat gun and we'll heat that up and it'll shrink it down. Okay, now we have a heat gun here. And what you wanna do, now you wanna make sure you don't point your heat gun at anything in the car because it will melt it. But we can now heat up that tubing and it'll shrink it right down. There we go. Now move this out of the way. Guys, that is a professional solder job. We have the solder um, together with our heat shrink tubing over it. That will never come apart and that's professional. All right, now I have to do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven more of these, and I will come back when I'm done. Okay, we are done with the soldering, and you can see all those are heat, heat shrink wrapped. Here are the speaker connections. And we also soldered on the blade connector right there guys that no radio shop is ever going to do a job this nice this is permanent and will last forever that's all the original mercedes wiring with the original connections and here is your antenna signal all right let's put the radio back in all right let's slip our radio back in place Okay, now I just need to reinstall the ashtray, which guys, that's just a simple uh, clip right here for the cigar lighter. That just clips on back here. Like that. Then you can slide, the, slide this guy right down in here. All right, now we slide back in our ashtray. Boom. Now I need to polish off all my fingerprints and clean it up. But mission accomplished, guys. Original radio and original wiring back to exactly how it left the factory. Let's see if we can set our time here. I think it's about... 12 o'clock, we'll I think it's 12.45, there we go, 12.45, lights up when we turn our lights on. Awesome, mission accomplished. So today I am removing and replacing the hood pad and you guys can see this is actually the original hood pad. The uh, uh, material here uh, separated from the original foam backing and uh, over the years guys this stuff just deteriorates. Uh, you can see the foam, the foam backing up here and you can just pull it off with a uh, paint scraper. But notice uh, there's a heat shield here. Now that is unique to the California model cars. Because if you remember, um, the turbo was raised up and actually located, where is it? It's right, there it is. It's like right here. And the heat radiates right there from the turbo. So the federal cars, the 49 state federal cars did not have a heat shield right there. So um, when you look up a hood pad for these cars, it always shows the California model hood pad. However, just remember, I think Phoebe uh, sells one that does not have the heat shield, and that's correct for your other 49 state uh, other models. So we have some, uh, yeah, if we have some residue like this right here uh, left over, that's okay. Some people go crazy trying to get these perfectly clean 
and you do not have to do that. Okay, we have all that old pad scraped off and you can see there's a lot of glue residue um, and some of the foam, like, you know, the residue of where it was on there. Uh, guys, you do not need to scrape that off. Like I said in the video, the glue that we're gonna put on here will absolutely hold the new pad fine. So let me go ahead and show how to install the new pad. Okay, so you can see I have the engine compartment covered with a blanket and I have our hood pad laying right there. And now I want to apply the adhesive, super trim adhesive, uh, part number 08090. Now you want to put half of this on the pad and half of this on the hood. There we go. All right, now we want to let that sit for about five minutes until it gets a little tacky and then we'll lift the hood pad up there. All right, so we have a notch right here. We want to make sure that notch lines up right there in the center. And then you want to push down from the center and then you want to go from the center out. Go. Then we want to tuck in our edges. All right, now I just want to get some tape and like get off the little pieces of like debris on here, and then we'll be good to go. And there you go, guys. There is our beautiful new hood pad. Now, it's very important with the California models, you get a hood pad that has the foil uh, heat shield right there. Because when this hood closes, that goes right over the turbo exhaust area. And that protects, protects the hood from all that heat. So what you guys saw in this video, uh, I condensed it to like a little over an hour. But this was several days of work. So I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I will see you in the next video on the 1985 Cali Wagon. Thanks for watching.